we are on the air. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today for the first episode in season two of Research Aromatica. Um, it's a real honor and privilege today for me to be introducing you to Robin Van Loon. Uh, the title of his presentation today is Amazonian Essential Oils for Forest Regeneration. Uh, Robin is the founder and executive director of Camino Verde. He has lived in Tambopata province of the Peruvian Amazon since 2004, a longtime student of traditional and indigenous agriculture and medicinal practices. His work has focused on developing community-based reforestation strategies to regenerate important endangered plants of the Amazon. He's a writer, a regenerative designer and a consultant in agroforestry, reforestation and regenerative development. So without further ado, it is my privilege to turn the floor over to you, Robin. And just before, sorry, just before I do, I should say to the audience, we are broadcasting live today and Robin is in Peru. So um, he has gone through quite a bit to be able to be here live with us today. Um, his his area of Peru is on lockdown and um, he's at the, the reforestation site, he's at Camino Verde. So if you notice a little blurriness or anything with his camera, it's because he's out in the rainforest, he's in the Amazon. <laughs> so Robin, let me turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Anjanette. Uh, and thanks for uh, inviting me to this platform. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, and indeed, I am uh, beaming in live from the Peruvian Amazon, uh, which is where Camino Verde has worked for uh, close to 15 years now uh, in reforestation uh, and agroforestry based on native species of the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, so knock on wood that the signal uh, stays sharp, but um, so far so good uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's great to be here. So I'm I'm going to go ahead and and start the the slide presentation that'll be here with me. Um, and indeed, the the name of this talk is Amazonian Essential Oils for Forest Regeneration. Um, and in the hopes of making the Amazon feel uh, a little bit uh, less abstract or a little bit closer, a little bit more tangible. Um, this presentation is intended to be something of a visual journey as well. Uh, and the, the Amazon is the Earth's greatest uh, terrestrial experiment in biodiversity. Uh, and I'd like to share a little bit of that biodiversity in images that can tell the stories uh, even better than the words can. So speaking of stories, uh, in, in the interest of giving a more human dimension to Amazonian essential oils. Uh, I wanted to start today by telling a story about a 58-year-old tree um, that's actually a good example of what we mean by forest regeneration. Um, and this is a, a great place to start uh, because in a way this story is in fact also telling the history of Amazonian essential oils. Um, and it's, it's the story of uh, a 58-year-old tree that, that started out uh, looking like this. Um, it, it was a seedling that was planted by uh, my friend Julia's father when Julia was just five years old. Um, and I'm changing everybody's name to, to respect people's privacy. Um, but Julia's father had brought home a few seedlings that looked just like this. Um, after he had been working for years under what was called the Hacienda system, um, in his case on the Putumayo River in the north of Peru, uh, on the border with Ecuador. Um, and the, the Hacienda system, system was something of a remnant of the mass enslavement of the conquest era. Um, and in some ways uh, in the Peruvian Amazon, it was also um, a continuation of an era of great violence, uh, which was the, the rubber boom times. Um, so for many people working in the haciendas, they were sort of 
forced to be there um, and the work could be intense, the, the bosses could be brutal. Um, and in the case of uh, Julia's father, uh, the hard work was also rather mysterious. Um, he, he was in an hacienda where uh, the work that was demanded of the team was uh, included wrapping chains around uh, massive rainforest trees and pulling them up from the soil, roots and all. And huge two-man saws were used to cut the tree trunks into short logs. And as the saw blades swished back and forth, Julia's father and his coworkers uh, looked at each other as if to say, can you smell that too? Uh, and that's because the trees that they were pulling from the ground uh, were a tree that today we call rosewood. Um, and, and rosewood is kind of a common, uh, a very common, common name. Uh, rosewood uh, is used for species from Central America, from South Asia, um, and from here, from the, from the Amazon. And so for distinction, we, we can call it Brazilian rosewood too. Um, and it's an, an aromatic tree um, that we'll uh, talk more about in a second. Um, but in the uh, Hacienda's main camp, where mechanical shredders and, and makeshift distillation equipment were set up, practically in the middle of the forest, uh, there was a curious process going on uh, that Julia's father was working on, um, where the wood was, uh, un was shredded, uh, it was passed through metal pipes, um, everything was strapped together with rubber straps, and even vines lashing the components of the distiller together. Uh, and Julio's father didn't know it at the time, um, but the thick, transparent, finished product that came out of the distillery would be sent to Brazil, then to Europe. And from these obscure origins deep in the Amazonian rainforest, the, the oil, the essential oil of rosewood would find its way to perfume houses uh, that were and continue to be the, the definition of, of luxury. So finally, Julia's, hard, Julia's father's hard work meant that he was able to buy his freedom back off the company ledgers. And with his young children in tow, he moved to the river basin where Julia would grow up to be a mother and then a grandmother, and as she was when I met her. Um, and he brought home a few seedlings of the tree that he'd, be work he'd been working so hard on, um, which was a species that was known to his people, the Borda. Um, and to us, it's called Brazilian rosewood. To the Borda, it's Macapae. And the seedlings were planted uh, in Julia's family compound um, out behind the outhouse. And one day I would get the chance to see the one surviving seedling now as a massive adult tree, almost a, a meter in diameter. Now, Rosewood, uh, as I say, is the, the story of Rosewood is something of uh, the history of Amazonian essential oils. Um, and Rosewood was an ingredient in Chanel number no. five, which is kind of crazy if you, if you think about the plant's origin in, in the Amazon rainforest. Um, and if it sounds at all surprising or, or brutal um, that the work to extract rosewood came from a form of modern slavery, uh, if you will, well, this, this wasn't the first instance of forced labor uh, experienced by the border people um, or experienced by uh, Amazonian people uh, in recent memory. Um, and I'm referring again to the history of rubber, uh, which involved tremendous exploitation of native peoples. And it, it was really a kind of a Holocaust. Um, and it's not, it's not easy to read the history of Colombia, Brazil, and Peru during that time. Um, rubber was one example of intense exploitation of Amazonian natural resources. Um, Rosewood was another, uh, not that long after really, just a couple of generations. And, and Rosewood, uh, before there was Rosewood, there, there really wasn't exploitation of aromatic species for perfumery. 
um, here in, in the Peruvian Amazon. Now, a few generations after the, the events that I was just describing, um, the Borda people are free, um, but have relatively few economic opportunities. Um, and my, my first visit to a Borda village was in 2011. Uh, and there we got to talking about Rosewood. Um, and I, I was, uh, you know, a young gringo in my late 20s, uh, but in this kind of post-colonialist reality, uh, I was given the deference of a reforestation expert uh, when I was in the community. Um, I'd been planting trees already for a few years. Um, and we got to talking about what some of the native species in the area uh, are, and, and I wondered out loud if, if there were any seed trees uh, nearby for, for rosewood. Um, and it was intriguing to me that, that rosewood was very familiar to the people in the community and, uh, and was of interest to them to plant more. Um, and uh, I wondered if the community was interested in planting rosewood and, and the answer was yes. Um, and now just to give a little additional context um, to this, uh, initiative, this decision to, to plant rosewood trees, um, uh, the Amazonian indigenous people in general um, have exceptional levels of knowledge of a huge variety of plants. Um, the, the Amazon is uh, uh, kind of the, the world's great experiment in terrestrial biodiversity and of course, 30% of all of the species of organisms in the world are from the Amazon. Um, and so uh, people who have, who have been uh, sort of developing knowledge of this landscape for thousands of years, uh, obviously have a, a huge and diverse intimacy with uh, the species of their landscape. And that includes aromatics. And so uh, here in this image, uh, just to introduce you to one of the aromatics of the Amazon, uh, this is misquipanga, uh, which is a plant that is primarily used for dye. Um, those sort of dark uh, pods that you can see behind the flower there, um, those give a dark purple color, which um, can then be boiled with uh, palm fibers to, to give them color. And that's the primary use for misquipanga. Um, but the name misquipanga uh, in the, the Quechua of the northern jungle of Peru um, refers to something that's sweet, something that's edible. Um, and inside those black pods, um, there's an orange aromatic pulp um, that is used in some soups. Um, and also the, the leaves of this ginger family plant um, are used to flavor food. Um, but the most interesting thing aromatically about this plant um, is that the seeds uh, have an intense aroma, which is actually rather similar to cardamom, uh, to which this plant is related. Um, and, and this is just one example of the incredible diversity of life that's harnessed for multiple uses by people of the Amazon. Um, and it's, it's interesting to note in passing uh, that aromatic plants that are, are edible are probably the, the original aromatic plants of, of interest to humans everywhere. Um, and so in the case of misquipanga, the leaves are wrapped around fish, for example, and then grilled or steamed. Um, and so there's interest in aroma because there's interest in, in flavor. And of course, uh, aroma plays so much of a, a role in, in our taste um, that we can't talk about aromatic plants of the Amazon without uh, talking, at least in passing, about the, the edible ones. Um, but it's, it's also curious to note before we move on from misquipanga uh, that wrapping fish in the leaves and, and then steaming the leaves, um, this is actually an example of 
the Amazonian use of aromatic steams in a medicinal way, um, which we'll talk about further um, in a couple minutes. Um, but let's go back to Rosewood for a second. And this image here actually shows uh, the, the seeds of uh, a rosewood tree that is now eight years old, uh, planted in 2013. Um, and so uh, after my first visit to Julia's community, uh, we indeed uh, had the good fortune of uh, finding finally, after years of searching, uh, some rosewood seeds like these ones and, and starting our first ever rosewood seedlings. And so in 2013, we planted our first rosewood trees um, with Julia's community and also um, here where I am now, which is Camino Verde's primary reforestation center in Tambopata in Southern Peru. Um, and so uh, after some years after having planted rosewood trees with Julia's family and other families in her community, um, and going and visiting those rosewood trees uh, for three years, four years, and then arriving at the point where we could start harvesting some branches without injuring the trees, without having to resort to tearing whole trees up out of the ground like had been the case uh, in the past. Um, we, we actually do what we call har harmless harvest of the trees where we prune only the, the lowest uh, side branches of the trees. Um, and those branches are the, the source of the essential oil that we've been producing for several years now. Um, and it was, I think around the time when we first started harvesting branches from the trees planted in Julia's community um, that finally I was given the chance to see the tree that Julia's father had planted, which um, of course had been planted in their family compound uh, when, when Julia was a girl 50 some odd years ago. Um, and when we went to the site, it, it no longer looked like uh, a family compound had been there at all. It was, um, it was really, uh, maybe not Indiana Jones adventure, but a, a Richard Evans Schultes kind of adventure deep into the forest. Um, and there, there was no sign of a, a farm there any longer. Um, but we did uh, get the chance to, to visit that tree and even to uh, bring back home uh, a few seedlings from that storied rosewood tree that Julia's father had planted so many years ago. Um, and it, it was finding seed trees like, like that one that uh, gave us the, the chance, the good fortune to get involved in a supply chain for rosewood. Uh, before this Camino Verde's focus had been on reforestation itself, planting trees in a, a manner that, that is successful. And, and for us, that means uh, always polycultures, never monocultures. Um, for us, that means uh, focusing on native species, and, and it means planting systems that uh, aren't just diverse for being diverse, but that actually imitate the diversity of the natural forest in, in the natural forest's function and, and structure. Um, so uh, we, we started planting rosewood in 2013, um, and now uh, many of those eight-year-old trees um, are also producing seeds, are also producing seedlings. Um, and this year has been a year of real fruition for, for this program. It's, it's crazy during 2020 and the year of COVID that anything could be um, a time of fruition. Um, but this uh, was the year when we um, expanded our, our rosewood planting uh, to include uh, over 100 families um, in four native communities uh, planting rosewood. So um, we, we get to see flowers on our trees like, like the ones in, in this image. Um, and nowadays, uh, 
rosewood, because it has been so endangered, because it's um, historically linked to over-exploitation, um, like in the Hacienda times, um, it's uh, also a species that is uh, being controlled by CITES. CITES is the um, an, an international treaty that governs the commerce of endangered species. Um, and so for both plants and animals, um, CITES uh, determines sort of which plants um, should be restricted and, and shouldn't be allowed to just be freely sold in a way that could be detrimental to those plants' um, endangered populations. Um, so rosewood was overexploited in Peru and in Brazil, which are the main places where it's found, um, to the extent that it was uh, considered endangered by national governments and also by international organizations. Um, so it's on the IUCN red list, um, and indeed it's in Appendix 2 of, of CITES. Um, and, and that means that um, with good reason, uh, if you're going to export rosewood essential oil, um, you have to have real transparency in the origin of where that rosewood comes from. So uh, part of our work with the communities where we're planting rosewood involves a bit of bureaucracy in the sense of uh, having to, for example, register um, the rosewood planting areas um, as forestry plantations, it's called, uh, with, with the National Forestry Service. Um, and that's one of several steps needed to allow the, the transparent and legal um, and fully documented export of rosewood uh, essential oil. Um, but rosewood isn't Peru's only significant CITES species, actually. Um, there's uh, mahogany, there's uh, a timber tree related to mahogany called Spanish cedar and others. And, and actually, uh, this image here um, is of a CITES species called Pau Brasilia echinata, uh, formerly known as Cecilpinia echinata, um, also known as Pernambuco or Brazil wood. And, and yes, Brazil has the, the special honor of being named after a tree. Um, Brazil wood is uh, a species that occurred frequently in the Mato Atlantico, the, the Atlantic rainforest of Brazil. And um, Pau Brasil uh, is now also known to be the source of exceptional timber. Um, and like rosewood, it's a tone wood um, and it's highly sought after for the bows of violins and cellos. Um, and so Obviously, CITES species are almost by definition economically valuable. Um, in, in most cases, that's why they're endangered. Uh, and yet, for me and for others working with these species, uh, to try to bring them back from the brink and, and actually um, to bring them back with added vigor, we've had a sort of a key light bulb go off. Um, and that light bulb says that the same market forces that drove these species nearly to extinction can also incentivize the regeneration of these species. The, the market wants rosewood oil, and which makes rosewood trees valuable. Um, and in the case of rosewood, thankfully, you can get the oil from carefully, harmlessly harvested branches or leaves um, just as surely as from digging the whole tree up from the ground. And, and that's the, a key thing. Uh, it, it means that we can start harvesting branches from young trees, three or four years old. And that's a similar timeline to fruit trees in the tropics, um, which of course is something that, that farmers are familiar with and, and have in mind as far as a, a productive timeline. So if, if you had to wait 20 years or 50 years before harvesting rosewood, well, then planting it wouldn't be that appealing. Um, and sadly, that's what happens with mahogany and with Brazil wood, um, is that they're not planted because their timeline is, is not seen to be on, a, on an appealing sort of human scale. Um, but in the case of rosewood, all these key pieces line up. 
to allow it to be a species uh, that is used for regeneration. Um, and regeneration, what, what do we mean by that? Um, are, are we just talking about setting up tree nurseries and planting trees or, or what does it mean? Um, and I guess regeneration, we're, we're really talking about two things which ultimately are, I think, part of the same thing. Um, and, and we're talking about ecological restoration, um, meaning we're, we're bringing back uh, the functionality of our landscapes. Um, but it, it also means uh, people. It, it's, it's also about um, understanding that human beings now play a unique role in the landscapes of our planet and are inevitably going to be important actors in uh, how a landscape is, is treated. Um, so humans are, in a certain sense, at, at this point, a key species within the ecosystem. So for the restoration of a forest to be successful, we necessarily have to grapple with human well-being and prosperity. But yes, regeneration is also about the environment. It's about restoration, uh, restoring the landscape, bringing back the form and the functionality of forests, uh, their anatomy and physiology. Um, and it can be compellingly de demonstrated that regeneration is, is functioning. Um, for example, when you see uh, a particularly charismatic example of the fauna, a, a jaguar in this case, um, in an area right nearby, uh, one of our reforestation areas. Um, and indeed, the, the presence of animals is, is one of the, the key indicators that can show us that uh, that a planted area is restoring ecological functioning and and therefore is regenerative. Um, now, in order to restore effectively, again, our planting systems uh, would do well to imitate the the natural systems. Uh, you you imitate the shape and uh, design, if you will, uh, almost the architecture of the forest. Uh, in your planting systems. Uh, but this doesn't just happen in space, it also happens in time. So we, we talk about successional agroforestry um, where you plant short-term crops, your corn, your bananas, your cassava, um, but in the same parcel you plant medium-term crops, uh, cacao, palm species that bear fruit, um, and in the same parcel, you plant your long-term species, uh, your hardwoods like mahogany that maybe do take 20 or 40 years. Um, and so in a certain sense, uh, and this is something emphasized in the, the framework of permaculture, uh, but also in the framework of analog forestry and in the field of forest landscape restoration, it's that our, our planting systems have to be based on the, the natural ecosystem, which you might say is uh, basing it on what nature wants for itself. Um, and we might even say that our economic systems also would do well uh, to imitate the natural system, to, to take its key uh, impulses from the natural system around it. Um, and so we can say in a way that the abundance of natural systems can be transferred over to our human systems, to our farms and to our economies, if we are faithful in our imitation of nature. Um, and so when our human systems are designed in ways that draw from nature's playbook, they're resilient. And, and of course, native people knew this, they, they were resilient, they were uh, living successfully in the Amazonian landscape for thousands of years. Um, and in some cases, uh, it took Western observers a long time to even notice that the farms and the semi-managed wild areas surrounding native communities were in fact human systems and human planting systems. Uh, they looked more like the wild than like a cultivated area to Westernize. 
And so it's only in the last hundred years that scientists have really apprehended the sophistication of these systems, which draw directly from the wild. So taking the notion of imitating nature one step further, um, even our business plans could in some ways draw from nature's model. So let's look at a few of the key points in that natural model, the ecological principles that make the Amazon tick uh, and that make it a mega abundant landscape. First, the, the Amazon is defined by its diversity. It abhors a monoculture. If we want to regenerate the Amazon, we have to include a diversity of species. No one silver bullet will meet the economic needs of communities in a landscape that invests a great deal in its diversity. Um, and everybody, of course, loves to hear about reforestation and planting trees, but um, there are also aromatic plants in the Amazon that are much smaller. And so uh, actually this image is of a ground hugging herb called mukura. Um, and its aromatic leaves are used by hunters to conceal the human scent uh, but also medicinally. Um, its aroma smells faintly of garlic, but it's also pleasantly sweet and floral. Um, and so uh, we, we can't just put all our eggs in the basket of, of rosewood. Um, and in a forest with so many aromatic plants like this one, um, it's uh, uh, important to remember that uh, diversity is, is a key to the success of uh, even an economic system like essential oils. Um, now the, the aromatics themselves are a part of the ecology of plants. The, these plants here, these seedlings are estorake or balsam of Peru, Myroxylon balsamum. Um, these plants, produce special marvelous chemicals uh, to systemically protect themselves and also in some cases to be attractive to certain animals such as pollinators or seed dispersers. Um, and also speaking of ecology, it's part of the ecology of us human beings that we can smell and appreciate so many different plant compounds. We're a unique animal species on earth um, in that we take a deep interest in so many different non-human species, so many scents of the forest. Um, now this, this particular tree here, uh, before passing to the next slide, I do wanna mention it's, it has an amazing smelling resin, which is called balsam of Peru. Um, it's sort of sweet and vanilla-like, um, but also uh, reminiscent of amber, um, but curiously enough, this tree has multiple smells, multiple scents. Um, and it's also a timber tree, which when cut exudes an amazing different uh, rich aroma from its wood. Um, it's a, a large canopy tree. And, and so unfortunately it's often cut for, for its beautiful timber. Um, and that timber has an incredible scent, which is totally unlike the scent of the resin. And, and finally, uh, the leaves themselves, you, you can break off a leaf and uh, it has a wonderful scent, which is not like the resin of the tree and is not like the wood of the tree. Um, and so uh, this is just one example of the, the incredible aromatics. And, and just to drive the, the point home that uh, sort of while rosewood is a powerful species for uh, transforming local economies um, and an opportunity for regeneration, it's, it's certainly not, not the only uh, species that is worth consideration. Um, here are just a few uh, actually of, of Rosewood's relatives in the Loraceae family. Um, this is Ocotea acephala. Um, again, Ocotea acephala. This is Endlicheria krukovi which has a, a beautiful aroma um, similar to camphor and Enlicheria williamsi, which is uh, almost a, a, a frankincense-like aroma from a, a Loraceae. Um, so uh, if we're going to plant trees in ways that are economically meaningful, but also ecologically functional, we're going to need a variety of species. Um, and so that's one of the principles driving the diverse agroforestry planting systems that Camino Verde establishes in partnership with smallholders and native communities. 
And sure, maybe Rosewood has an outsized role to play economically. Maybe it's like a cash crop at the center of the productive system. Uh, but it's clear that rosewood is not the only essential oil bearing tree. And, and when we plant a variety of species, we gain in resilience, um, resilience both to market shifts and resilience to pathogens in our planting system. Um, and so when we talk about regeneration, we really are talking about the restoration of ecological functioning um, and, and ecology what does that mean? It, it, it's sort of, it's talking about the relationship among species and e even among kingdoms of species. And so uh, in, in the Amazon, there are an incredible variety of uh, relationships between species, which are governed by aroma, which are governed by chemical signals. And so here, this is the, the Tangarana, which is, is an ant um, with a very nasty bite and if you get bit by several of the ants, it'll give you fever. Um, and it, leave, it lives in a particular species of tree. Um, and if you take the bark from the tree and, and prepare it uh, as a tea, it will give you fever in the same manner as the ants do. Um, and this actually cures uh, dysentery. Um, so uh, there's the much more familiar example of an interspecies interaction having to do with the aroma of, of flowers. And, and this is a, a solitary bee from the Amazon pollinating a, a Gustavia flower, which is quite nice smelling. Um, these are Melipona, Melipona bees um, from the, the Peruvian Amazon from here. Um, this is the, the entry to their nest. And so aroma in, in the ecosystem uh, has a lot to do with ecological functioning. It has to do with pollinators. Um, it has to do with uh, sort of the, the botany of desire of us humans. Um, what, what sense do we find attractive? Um, and, and these are really ecological relationships, if you think about it. Here in, in the Amazon, there is uh, such an abundance of uh, aromatic species that it, it can uh, really be considered like a, an underutilized resource. Um, there are so many species with untapped potential um, in, in the realm of aromatics. Um, and just to, to highlight a few of these um, aromatic ecological relationships, um, these species uh, tend to attract uh, the pollinators with, with their flower aromas, um, as well as attracting us humans. And, and we often think of uh, bees when, when we think of pollinators, but, but actually there are a number of other pollinator species in the Amazon, including this moth here. Um, and flowers that are sort of uniquely designed to attract very specific pollinators like butterflies in this case. Um, but there are also a number of species that are aromatic that are pollinated by flies. Um, this is a, a relative of yerba mate that's native to the Amazon um, that's pollinated by flies. Uh, and it makes a nice tea, by the way. And one of our favorite aromatic plants of all, uh, cacao, from, from which we derive chocolate, uh, it's also pollinated by flies. And, and the family of plants that it comes from, uh, many of the plants are pollinated by flies. And so their, their flowers have strange and, and maybe not such agreeable aromas. Um, and yet what we get from these flies is uh, cacao and cacao's relatives. This is macambo. And uh, a sort of a roundup of the diversity of aromatic plants in the Amazon wouldn't be complete without touching on vanilla. Um, and the Amazon is, is home to several species of vanilla. This is probably the most promising one, vanilla pompona. Um, this is an orchid. It's, a, it's an orchid that grows like a vine. Um, it's not a parasite. It simply grows on top of other plants. And where it's found native in the Peruvian Amazon is in swampy, humid areas um, where it grows on certain palm tree species. 
Uh, and so this is a, a, a design in nature, if you will, that we've also transferred over to the agroforestry systems um, where we, we plant vanilla vines onto palm trees and onto reforestation trees um, and, and harvest a really valuable aromatic product as a result, which are these, uh, these vanilla pods. And there's actually several different species of, of vanilla in the Amazon. Um, so uh, as you can see, our, our cues kind of come from the forest and, and even the inspiration for um, what products to pursue. And in that sense, the, even the business plan is uh, derived from a relationship with the landscape, um, a relationship with the ecosystem. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna finish up in just just a minute here, um, but I wanted to mention just uh, one other intriguing um, connection between the the ecology and and the traditions of the Amazon um, and the world of uh, essential oils in modern times. Um, and this plant here is a plant uh, called ajosquiro. It's uh, a tree whose name has the word ajo or garlic in it. And indeed the, the tree's leaves, its bark, essentially every plant part of the tree um, smells strongly sulfurous. They, they smell of garlic. Um, and this is another plant which uh, like mukura, which I mentioned before, um, was used to disguise the human scent, uh, especially for hunters. Um, and, and so animals wouldn't pick up on the presence of, of hunters uh, as easily. And, and the way that this was administered, the way that this plant was uh, allowed to, to function in this way was through steam baths. Um, and not only for hunters preparing for the hunt, but also for a variety of different uh, illnesses and complaints in the Amazon for hundreds or maybe thousands of years, steam baths of plants have been used uh, at, to sort of administer uh, certain benefits of certain plants. And, and these plants are overwhelmingly aromatic plants. Um, and so while it's true that in the Amazon, we don't have uh, distillers as something that was uh, found thousands of years ago here in the jungle, um, there is uh, sort of an ancient cultural technology uh, which is similar to distillation is, is unleashing um, the aromatic compounds of plants uh, and, and sort of delivering them to people. Um, so I, I wanted to just before closing highlight that uh, kind of traditional connection um, to the, the technology and the practice uh, of essential oil um, and, and in conclusion, uh, just wanted to share that um, while aromatics themselves are not a silver bullet or, or the only solution for restoration of the Amazon rainforest and its native communities, um, it's certainly a, a tool in the toolkit um, that's worth uh, sort of greater uh, development. And, and we certainly feel based on our experience that there's much room uh, for additional growth of aromatic plants as part of regenerative com economies in the Amazon. So thank you very much for, for joining me, for, for listening. And uh, I'd, I'd be, I guess, happy to, to turn it over if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. What a beautiful presentation, the visuals. Um, and we do have a couple questions that came through and you were starting to uh, uh, talk about that a little bit more. Um, one of my students is asking, why, why are you producing essential oils? What is the link to producing essential oils and restoration? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so, uh, in, in our own experience, uh, Camino Verde started as uh, an organization with uh, the intention to plant as many different useful species of the Amazon as possible. 
Um, and essentially, uh, we, we experienced how most of the economic use of local plants, like in the case of Rosewood in the past, was based on extraction of the resources from the natural forest. Um, and there really weren't so many experiences with uh, the, the silviculture of those species. How do you plant these trees? How fast do they grow? Um, those experiences, even the experience of how to germinate the seeds of many species were few and far between and, and continue to be. Um, and so uh, our, our first program and intention was to kind of uh, plant as much as possible of the diversity of, uh, of the Amazonian species in our region um, that are considered useful, considered economically valuable, and which are being extracted from the rainforest. Um, so during that first phase, uh, Camino Verde planted over 400 species of trees uh, here at our reforestation center. Um, and eventually uh, came to the understanding that in the case of certain products that, that seemed particularly promising, um, that it would really enhance our mission as a nonprofit organization um, to develop uh, not just sort of market opportunities so that, uh, and, and we've done this in the past where um, sort of let's, let's give market opportunities to uh, smallholder farmers here in the Peruvian Amazon that are planting things like cacao or cacao's other relatives that, that you saw in the slides. Um, but uh, with essential oil was the one uh, product, what we would call a non-timber forest product um, that we experimented with and, and made the decision to directly get involved with the supply chain. Um, and and in the sense of rosewood and rosewood's diverse relatives that are also aromatic, um, it, it just seemed like um, this was something that, uh, it, it was an opportunity waiting to happen to, to further develop um, a regenerative supply chain based on the planting of trees um, and the harvest of branches from those reforested trees rather than uh, the extractivist economy of just exploiting the species in the wild, um, which has been the norm for, for all of documented history of the Amazon. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you talked about um, humans being a part of regeneration and being a part of creating landscapes uh, versus keeping people out for regeneration or protection of, of forests. And so your model is really to work directly with people in the landscape. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah. Uh, no, it's, uh, I, I think that for the sort of the space of conservation and uh, environmentalism and, um, and restoration, uh, in, in these fields, um, there is definitely a tendency uh, historically and, and currently um, to kind of, uh, it, it, it's what you might call the national park model of let's uh, sort of protect areas, put a fence around them, kind of keep people out um, and, and let nature do what nature knows best. Um, and, and I think that that, uh, is is certainly uh, valid and necessary um, and and helpful in regard to particular vital landscapes that and and special places that we should absolutely protect. Um, but it it also uh, is quite different from an understanding of the Amazon as like yes, this is a wild landscape. Yes, this is a natural uh, landscape that functions as a forest, but which for thousands of years has supported. Uh, a quite large sized population of of people who lived with a, a certain degree of equilibrium with the forest. Um, and so uh, I, I think uh, sort of cultural restoration and ecological restoration go hand in hand in that sense. Um, but but going back to the question directly, um, I, I guess, uh, it's it's also uh, well, uh, unfortunately, is is the reality now that um, essentially every native community, essentially every smallholder farmer in the Amazon, 
already has deforested areas on their land. Um, the Amazon is not just sort of some pristine uh, landscape and it's it's not just black and white where it's like, okay, here is the, the area that's being protected and there's no people there. And, and over here is the area that's been deforested. Um, often the landscape is kind of a, a mosaic and uh, like, every smallholder farmer in our area here has various hectares of land uh, that they've slashed and burned uh, to plant corn or to plant bananas, and then have later abandoned that farm because um, the soil is really fragile here. Um, and so uh, it's sort of like we, we already have these areas and everybody that we work with already has these areas that have been degraded, that have been deforested, and that are sort of by definition, these are areas that are waiting to be regenerated. Um, these are opportunities mm -hmm. for restoration. Um, so if that restoration uh, just happens in an altruistic sense of like, let's plant trees and bring the forest back, well, that's great, um, but that's typically expensive. It's typically hard to, to get uh, smallholder farmers in the Amazon to really get on board with just planting trees because it's a good idea. Um, but if those trees are productive, if those trees generate uh, benefits uh, in the sense of helping people to feed their kids, you know, um, like that's that's meaningful. Um, and so uh, it's sort of uh, it's something that I've come to terms with over the years too, from going to maybe a more idealistic perspective of like, I don't want to know about business plans, you know, um, to, to a perspective of like, well, people here do, and, and they do because they've, uh, they've lived with scarcity. They, they know what it's like not to have money for school uniforms for their kids. Um, and, and so, uh, the capital that they have available or the markets to which they have access um, have been uh, typically for things like timber, which are related to the destruction of the forest. Um, and so I think it's it's also a matter of kind of realigning markets uh, and market access so that there is um, like the ability on the farmer's side to be able to offer a variety of sustainable, renewable products that come from the forest um, just as easily or just as successfully as they would if it was a bunch of valuable mahogany timber. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that vision of seeing the degraded areas as an opportunity. And that's so important for environmentalists and people who who feel a lot of the pressure of a lot of the environmental problems to see the opportunity for regeneration. And that's that's really the key word right now. It seems to be uh, the buzzword is regeneration. And thank you so much, Robin, for um, just delivering us such a beautiful vision of regeneration. Um, one last question that came through is, is rosewood essential oil expensive? <laughs> uh, is this an expensive, is it? <laughs> It's it's not uh, it's certainly not the most expensive compared to uh, sandalwood and I, I think even compared to frankincense um, and and that's really uh, it, in a in a funny way it's like it's it's unfortunate that it's cheap uh, or it's not cheap but it's it's not among the most expensive oils um, and it's unfortunate in the sense that uh, that's sort of only been possible because of the type of exploitation and extraction that that rosewood has had in the past um, it's it's been sort of mined from the forest if you will um, and so uh, that allowed for a boom but it also allowed for for a bust um, but but we're still sort of managing uh, the economy of that product that was established at, at a time of just sort of uh, over exploitation to the extreme. Um, so it's it's kind of an artificial economy in that sense. Um, but uh, even using that uh, sort of, you know, not not the lowest, but not the highest, the sort of medium price point that Rosewood is at, um, I, I think it's, it's still very much uh, compatible to uh, efforts to reforest the trees um, and make it meaningful on a scale that a farmer can manage. So, you know, it's it's not about 
you know, a big corporation that can plant a hundred or a thousand hectares of rosewood. It, it's sort of uh, if a farmer just has 50 trees or just has a hundred trees, um, is that going to provide meaningful income to them? And and thankfully with rosewood, the answer is is yes. Um, but but that said, uh, do look for uh, rosewood um, in the store, and uh, it's it's always good to ask questions about where it's coming from. Um, and and our rosewood oil is uh, thankfully going to be available in uh, in stores this year in the U.S. Oh, fantastic! Um, well, definitely let us know about that when that happens. And we do have one one other question from Dr. Brian Lawrence. Uh, what species of Myrtaceae and the root Rutaceae family are looking promising as sources of essential oils? Great question. Uh, for Rutaceae uh, here in the Peruvian Amazon, we have a, a number of really intriguing uh, citrus uh, varieties that are they're they're typically talked about as like Creole. There's the Naranja Criolla, the Creole orange, um, which is an orange that can withstand the intense humidity and the intense heat and and the fungus of the Amazon. So it's it's a, a kind of a an orange that's become uh, a, an Amazonian orange over hundreds of years. Um, and we've been distilling a, a petite grain of this uh, orange, which is really marvelous. Um, and, and the other Rutaceae uh, is, is another citrus, it's sweet lime. There's a, a, a sweet lime that's grown a lot in this part of the Amazon that is really, uh, is really marvelous. Um, and uh, the Mertaceae, uh, we've done some test distillations of a number of different species of Eugenia. Um, so uh, this is the, the genus of the Suriname cherry, um, for whatever that's worth. Um, but the, the leaves of several species of Eugenia uh, that are native to this part of the Peruvian Amazon uh, have quite nice essential oil. So um, that's maybe not the only the only option, but I, I think that uh, that that genus is very promising, as is um, it's closely related to the genus Syzygium, which is where uh, cloves come from. Um, so not native to the Amazon, but it also grows here quite well. Um, but Syzygium and Eugenia have uh, interesting genetics when it comes to aromatics, I think. Very cool. So a lot of opportunities uh, at, that come with all of that beautiful biodiversity of the Amazon. And you've really painted us such a beautiful picture today. Robin, thanks for taking this time. Thanks for you know going through the hassle of getting on the internet for us today and being here. I'm so glad the connection held up. And uh, you know this talk will be posted so you can watch the replay and we will have Robin's contact information about the, the NGO Camino Verde for anyone who wants to look at the website and, and look a little further into the project. So thank you so much for being here today, Robin. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thanks to the audience. Bye everyone.